And we are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, etc., to part three in the series of Permaculture as a Design Science. If you're listening to it on the podcast, this is episode 3058 of the Survival Podcast. We're going to turn a corner in this series today. The first two episodes were designed so that this episode wouldn't be dangerous. So we're going to talk a bit about tactics, strategy, and techniques today. And I think it'll be really, I think most people will be really happy about the fact that today we're going to spend most of our time on techniques, the thing that you do and kind of how you do it. We won't go deep into hows, but we'll give you an overview of, I think it's something like 13 techniques today. And I have a few few bonus ones that will sneak in as well. And uh, then we're going to talk about scale of permanence and we'll wrap up with how this all gets implemented so that we have an overriding strategy that leads to good selection of technique and proper proper tactical implementation of techniques. And what I kind of want to explain going in, and we'll, we'll start off by uh, pulling up the PowerPoint deck here. And for those of you listening to the audio only, if any of the visual aids today, uh, you know, you can't you can't see them obviously on audio, and you want to look them up to have a better understanding. If you don't want to go through the entire video because you've just listened to the audio, uh, the PowerPoint deck and a PDF uh, download will be available in the audio notes for today's episode. Again, three thousand fifty-eight. Um, we're going to start out with why it's taken me so long to really dig deeply into technique with you, and it's so that you don't hurt yourself. So I want you to think about it like I give you a gun. Uh, It's loaded. It's got ammo in it. Maybe it's got a magazine full of ammo in it. And uh, it's not unsafe and it's not got a round chamber. And I say, this is a gun and this is how a gun works. And I hand you the gun and I don't give you safety training. I don't give you any perspective. I don't teach you about the basic rules of fire, you know, safe firearm handling, like knowing your backstop, not pointing a gun at anything you don't intend to destroy. Never put your finger on the trigger unless you're, I don't give you any of that. And we don't go with overriding strategy of why the hell do you have a gun in the first place? Is it to hunt? Is it to defend your home? Is it, you know, what is it for target practice? Are you a collector? Like you have no strategy, you have no tactics and you're weak on your techniques, but I teach you basic form, how to pull a trigger and how to charge the weapon and bring around out of the magazine and how to load magazines, put new magazines. And I say, go off, be fruitful and multiply. And worse, not only do you go off and do that, you are a walking hazard at that point. I think everybody would agree that you're a walking hazard at that point. Um, But if you're teaching, it's even worse, isn't it? Because you come and say, I got instructed by Jack Spearco on how to use the gun. Everybody knows Jack Spearco knows how to use a gun, and I am now a certified Jack Spearco gun instructor. I never said any such thing. I just did a video that showed you how to load a a weapon, and I was dumb, and I didn't include a disclaimer with it, and now you're running around with that technique with no tactics and no strategy. That's bad. And I think when we use a gun, everybody can understand how bad that is. With, With permaculture, What everybody latches on is the technique, swales, food forestry, gardening, composting, tons of different um, techniques that we can use in permaculture. Like I said, those are all arrows in the quiver. Uh, Jeff Lawton says they're all clothes in the wardrobe that is permaculture. And if we don't understand that and we don't understand that strategy has to drive the decision and that tactics have to drive the implementation of the technique, we're going to end up with type one errors. And what I want to start off with is what exactly is a type one error and how do we, how do we bring this over to permaculture and how does it differ a little bit from the way that scientifically we typically talk about the term? Um, This trigger, this, this picture might trigger some people here. um, But if it does, then that's your problem, not mine. A type one error is a false positive. That's a general way of defining it. So here we have a doctor telling a man that's clearly in his like late 70s, maybe mid 80s even, you're pregnant. So he's telling that clearly this dude's not pregnant, right? Like I said, it might trigger some people, but 80-year-old men don't get pregnant, guys. Men don't get pregnant, guys. Uh, so the doctor says you're pregnant. Now, if the, if the man believes him, this can lead to some bad things. And it's irreversible in that this guy is going to think he's pregnant until he doesn't have a baby. And he might do some things because of this positive 
that are bad decisions, like go out and spend a bunch of money on baby furniture uh, or, or whatever else you might do when you find out you're expecting. A type 2 error, the doctor's telling a clearly pregnant woman, you're not pregnant. This can also lead to some bad decisions. Maybe she goes out and has five glasses of white wine tonight and causes fetal alcohol syndrome. But unless something really dumb is done because of the type 2 error, it will self-correct. A false negative over time will self-correct unless it leads to a type 1 error. So the type 1 error would be you went out and, and, and tied a load on while you're pregnant and damaged your, your, your potential child. That, that is, But that's a type 1 error. And you made it because of bad information. So when we go into the world of permaculture and we say somebody made a type 1 error, they were sure they had a false positive that a dam went in this location. Whoops, it doesn't. Now you have a giant hole that doesn't hold water. You've made a type 1 error. Building on this, I want to kind of move on to my next slide and avoiding these type 1 errors. We need to understand very clearly then techniques, tactics, and strategies. And I like to boil these things down to the most succinct and simple definition that I can. And that is a technique is a thing that you do. That's what, if it's a thing that you do, it's a technique for the sake of this discussion. We can argue with Webster dictionary people later, but for this discussion, a technique is a thing that you do. And we can break that down into macro and micro. So if I say composting, which we'll talk about later, well, why? Worm composting, standard turn every three days, you know, quick composting with large amounts. Uh, are we going to be doing black soldier fly composting, uh, Johnson Sioux bioreactor composting? Just pile it up and let nature take it. There's a lot of ways to compost. So we have composting as a technique and then sub techniques. Gardening, okay, gardening, raised bed gardening, keyhole gardening, contour gardening. These are all sub-techniques within the greater technique, but it's a thing that you do. A tactic is how you implement the thing that you do. Where does it go? What's the timing of it? How does it connect to other things? So that's your tactic. A strategy is the reason you do the thing in the way that you do it. The reason you choose the technique and the reason that you use the tactics with that technique that's your overriding strategy. Trying to completely simplify it for you. Let's take it out of permaculture and into something that, you know, whether you're an MMA fighter, a uh, fight fan or not, it should be clear what we're talking about because we've separated from something we're attached to. Uh, a technique in permaculture. I want swales. I want a food forest. I want whatever you want. As long as you're in there, it's hard to get this better perspective. So a strategy for an MMA fighter is win the fight. Right. That's that's the strategy to win, to win the fight. The tactic, the opponent is weak on the ground. If you know your opponent is like he's got a good boxing game and a weak ground game, then your tactic is to employ techniques on the ground to your opponent's weakness. Right. The technique would be like specific locks that your opponent is weak defending. So not only might he be weak on the ground, but he might be weak to certain specific locks or other techniques where his game is weak and yours is strong. So you define the strategy, then you just determine the techniques and the tactics to accomplish the strategy. How does this keep us out of type 1 errors? The math at the bottom of this slide is, no, not, is not real. It's just a way to think about it. And what we have is TE is technique, TA is tactic, and ST is strategy. Technique minus tactic. Minus strategy equals T1E cubed. That means type 1 errors to the third power. Really bad. The further we get away from having the formula put together, the worse we get. But, but strategy plus technique plus tactical implementation equals S2. That's success squared, right? You will double your success if you do this properly. Next up. Let's start digging into some techniques. And I want to get into kind of the why of these techniques. And I do want to show, throw out a, a real quick thank you to the hammer on YouTube who sent me a super chat for five bucks. If you guys enjoy this today and you want to send me a super chat, you're welcome to do so. I was asked to turn the feature on. So I did. Thanks to the hammer there. All right. And also, if you have questions today, all caps for at least the first couple, three words, I won't even read them, but I'll hit a little star on them, and they'll go into my list of things to cover at the end. So let's start out with the keyhole garden. So 
Again, we are about to take the dangerous step here of giving you all types of techniques that you can implement. We're going to come back at the end with strategy and tactics. So I don't want you to grab one or two techniques and then go build a keyhole garden in the middle of your yard for no reason at all other than you thought it was cool looking. We have to think tactically with these techniques. That's the final warning. We'll go on and we'll talk about these techniques and how they get used and why they get used so we can apply tactics to the strategy that we're going to use them with. So in a keyhole garden, if you look at the image right here, you have a fairly round garden. It's made with stone. Works very, very beautiful. And then you have kind of, uh, it's almost like a reverse peninsula going into it so that a person can walk into that garden. And you can see that when you're inside the keyhole, you can reach the entire garden from inside that keyhole. One or two steps forward and backward is all you need to reach from the very back all the way around the entire keyhole garden. Now, you take my word for it. If you go to Google Images and you type in keyhole gardens, you're going to find most images that show a keyhole garden. There's no practical reason for it to be a keyhole garden. It's just the shape. And what I mean is the garden itself is not large enough to take advantage of the keyhole. One of the reasons I selected this image is because it's long, large enough to take advantage of the keyhole. If you build a circular garden or any shape of garden that you put a keyhole in, and generally they would be somewhat soft designs, somewhat rounded for these to be effective. And then you could have reached the entire garden without the keyhole. You've done it because it looks cool. You haven't actually gained anything from the design element. In this case, if you look at the size of this garden, if you were trying to reach the center of it from the outside circumference of it, you wouldn't be able to do it very well. It would be, it would be limiting to you. So this is well, well implemented from that design perspective. Now, is it well implemented in the totality of design? I don't know. My gut looking at the picture, the limited I can see on it, not really. Not really. Um, in fact, I would say I could probably get more density of planting in that same space if it was done as two separate gardens that you could walk in between. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's part of a large, but I could be wrong, right? I, who knows? Maybe there's 10 of these things lined up coming into there, but that that's my limited perspective there. But that's a keyhole garden. And I would say even that keyhole garden is a little bit limited in design and probably should have been a little bit larger in its outer circumference. If you look how thin it is between the keyhole and the outer rim, it it really takes so much square footage from the garden for that keyhole, it doesn't seem to make sense. So these can be very effective. They can be very useful. And if you're if you are using them to maximize edge, if you're growing a lot of small plantings that do well around the edge, there's a lot more edge in that garden than there would be if it was just a circle. So we, we need to think about that. We need to think, well, what can we stack into it? What are other things we can do? Here's one built out of landscape timbers. This one's fairly nicely built. Again, it appears to, and I think I was, this is why I picked this as my leadoff technique. There are a lot of people building things like keyhole gardens because they saw a picture of one and they thought it was cool. Looking at this one, it does look large enough to take advantage of the keyhole, but it looks like an isolated component in a backyard. It's not necessarily going to give that much advantage over perhaps doing something like a four foot wide, eight foot long raised bed and putting two of them and walking in between them. You could probably get the same reach out of them. But if this fits more square footage into an area that's limited, then it makes sense. But the big reason I wanted to bring this one up, this is a classical keyhole garden. The, the classical technique includes the addition of what we call and, and, and Freegan Dave is saying nice compost pit there in the middle, though. That is what we call a worm tower. And there's lots of ways to build them. This one was built with just some hardware cloth made into a circle, put down to the bottom of the bed. Then all of the fill was placed around it. And then you just throw compostables in there. So now we're adding composting to this. And we're adding a specific kind of composting in that we're doing worm composting and we're never having to touch the material a second time. Now, I'm not exactly a fan of the way this technique was implemented. It's wide open. Now, maybe it's just for the picture. I would want to take something like a flower pot uh, that's big enough to go around that wire mesh, turn it upside down, and fit it over it to cover it so it's not a big attractor of flies and things like that. 
this in my climate and in my my area of North Texas is also going to be an ant magnet. So people have often asked me, why don't you have worm towers? Because I don't want to, to encourage fire ants any more than they're already encouraged to be. So I don't use this technique, but this technique might well work well for you. Does the worm tower need to go in a keyhole garden? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You can have a four foot by eight foot bed, worm tower right in the middle or on one end, right? You could have one of these in every bed that you built. So like I said, there's some bonus techniques built into it, but this is keyhole gardens. Now, what can we do with a keyhole garden? Well, if instead of just isolating these as individual design components, what if we built along a property line, like a back property line, an entire stone wall across the back of the property line? And then we built a series of keyholes so that when we walk to the back property line, the entire back property fence is, is, is made with keyholes and it's filled in with garden growth. So now... If we had not done that, we would have had to put a very narrow garden bed in, right? We would have had to take a very, very narrow garden bed. So because we can't get to the other side because the neighbor's property, we have to be able to reach. So we're looking at two, three foot of width at the most. But if we have, let's say, four or six foot and we have keyholes that are going in three foot, space three foot apart, the entire length of the wall now we've maximized edge and we've maximized square footage and there's not a square inch of that bed that we can't effectively work. We've combined raised beds with keyholes. Now we're working at waist height. We don't have to bend over. We have perfect soil mixture. We could even tie wicking. We could make the whole thing a wicking bed if we really wanted to. This is an expensive wall. This is an expensive fence, right? However, it's a fence. It's a garden. If we add the composting towers, it's a composting system and it's permanent. And we can we can add irrigation here. We can do, like I said, we can make wicking beds that we'll talk about in a bit. Or, okay, we're going to build this giant long wall of keyholes. And then we're going to do what? We're going to fill it. Maybe it's going to be as high as this system. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's going to come up to our knees or our, our thighs. But we're going to build that system. And then what are we going to do once we build it? Well, we're going to fill it up. What are you going to fill it with? Some sort of soil mixture, right? Okay. When you put in pipe for irrigation, you have to dig a trench to bury it, correct? Well, here we would maybe take a line all the way to our back of our property line, which we want to do anyway. And then we don't have to trench anymore. Then we just throw the pipe on top of the ground in the bottom of the keyhole bed, put our stand-ups for our irrigation, put all our plumbing, automation controls, whatever we're going to do in. Then when we fill it, the irrigation's in place. We didn't have to dig a second hole. Now we've got a permanent fence. We've got a permanent garden, it's irrigated, and it's efficiently managed for uh, maximizing edge and control. We could do perennials in that. We could do annual gardening in that. We could do a mix. We could even do short, small uh, perennial bushes or vines or small trees like cornelian cherry into a system like that. Now it's beautiful. Now it's a fence and a fedge. See, now we're starting to stack. Now, which one of those is right for you? What's your budget? What's your strategy? What tactics are you going to implement? Think about that all the way through this, but that's another example of what we can do. Next up, contour gardens. These are actually, that's my property. That red building in the background out there, that's my chicken and duck coop. These are also wood core contour gardens, which we'll get to later, and how wood core and hygge culture are not necessarily the exact same. Um, so, Right now, that is no longer a garden. I actually transitioned this into a small orchard. We're going to talk about backyard orchards in a second as well. But what I want you to notice about these is unlike your conventional gardens that are raised beds all lined up with the fence or the house or whatever straight line there is, these kind of curve a little bit and they're little mounds. And they have flat level pathways in between them. And they were just put in, and except for the one that was planted in the foreground there already. Uh, with a cover crop, they have these flat paths on contour. Now, this is at a part of my property that actually slopes. I don't have a lot of slope, but here's where it slopes. And so what happens is as water comes down grade toward that slope, it's allowed to pass in between the different rows, and it slows and spreads the water through the entire garden. The big thing is, though, there is no erosion. This system has experienced 
zero erosion. We had flood events after it was put in, big time flood events. We had a May a few years ago, and uh, May a few years ago, we had 29 days of appreciable rainfall in a 31 day period. My buddy took pictures of the yard that's just on the, on your screen to the left of the image. He photoshopped in a shark, a sailfish, and the Loch Ness Monster because that's how much standing water there was in the yard again, just to the left of that, just to the left of that image there, right? And that's how much, and there was zero erosion here because it was on contour. So contour-based gardens can stop erosion, they can harvest rainfall, and it's a very comfortable system to work. If I kept this as an annual garden, um, you can see that walking those paths are nice and flat. I can work either side of them. They're about four foot wide and they come up about two foot in the center. And so it was very easy to work those as annual gardens as we transitioned it over into, um, into uh, an orchard system, a perennial system. That's a contour garden. Does that mean you should run out and put a contour garden in? See, at this point, your, your immediate answer to that question, if you thought about it for more than one second, then you're, you, we're, we're still working on you as a designer. The answer to that question is no. And you might say, but contour gardens fit my design. Correct. Maybe you are correct. Maybe that is true. Maybe tactically and strategically, contour beds go in your design. But what, what I just asked you is, just because you think it's cool, should you immediately figure out how to put them in your property? No. You, if you thought keyhole gardens were cool and you think I need to put that in, that system he just described, I need, no. Define the strategy, define the tactic, and the technique will lead you down the right path. You'll find the right technique. Let's start from kind of overhead, but let's understand all these strategies. I'm sorry, all these techniques. So why am I going through all the techniques then? I was thinking about this today when I was putting together this episode. And at the exact, like simultaneously, I'm finishing the PowerPoint deck. I'm setting up the streams. I'm setting up the live update page on the WordPress blog. I'm making the notes for the thing. I'm gathering information. I'm doing some quick video editing for some shorts. Like I'm doing this all simultaneously. And I'm, I'm thinking if I paid people to do this, I'd have two people doing the work I'm doing myself. Plus, I'd still be doing a third of it. How can I do all that shit? Because I've done it for years. I'm not talented. I'm not special. I'm not smart. If you do anything over time long enough, you learn all sorts of strategies, tactics, and techniques about the thing. By giving you the techniques today, what we're trying to do is as you form a strategy and you start to think tactically of how do I get there, you know instinctively this arrow right now, that's what I'm going to shoot into this location at this time under all of these constraints to get them done. So I want you to know as many techniques as possible, including some you may never use. I have never built a keyhole garden. I probably won't. It probably does not make sense on my property, tactically under my strategy for me to do a keyhole garden. I have implemented contour gardens. They're right there, but they're not gardens anymore. They've been transitioned into a perennial system when I built them as gardens. The only reason they were used as gardens is so there would be a crop for the first year or two before the orchard established itself, right? So that was a strategic timing. It's a contour garden becoming a wood cord orchard on contour with swale-like features in the landscape. The day I put it in as a garden, I knew it wasn't staying there. That's stacking in time, right? When you start to think this way, Everything changes, and you'll wonder why a person that's been doing this a while can come out to your property and talk to you, and they'll talk to you for 20 minutes to two hours or more, and you're thinking, when are we going to get to the landscape? And they're analyzing you first, so they figure out, what does this person want? How do I get it for them? How much effort do they put in? How much budget do they have? When a permaculture designer asks your budget, it's not like somebody trying to sell you computer hardware. I'll be honest, when I was selling computer hardware, when I went into a customer and said, well, what's your budget for hardware this year? And they said $1.2 million. Guess how much hardware they were going to buy? $1.2 million on my hardware if I had anything to do about it, right? When I was selling test equipment, how much? what's your test equipment budget? You know, $400,000. We're going to find you $400,000 worth of shit to buy. 
when a permaculture designer comes in, generally they're not selling you the most expensive parts, the materials. Most of the time, they're not selling you the labor. Most consultants come in and do a design for you. They charge you for the design and walk away. So when they ask your budget, you probably already negotiated your, your contract fee with them. They want to know, I'm not going to design you a $30,000 design to implement over the next five years if your implementation budget over the next five years is $5,000. I need to know that. So they, they take all this in and they say, okay, what are we dealing with here? And we're not going to come in and use, like if, if I came in to consult with you and you said, well, I want contour gardens. We're not, we're not there yet. Do you, do you understand how much more work that system right there would be as an annual system than a perennial one? You probably don't, but the answer is a lot because you see all that grass to the left side of the image. That's Bermuda grass. Guess what that does? That climbs right in there. When I put this in, my students were saying, oh God, Bermuda grass, look, it's going to get you. Like it was a monster. It's not going to get me. It's trees. Trees don't care. If I tried to maintain that as a vegetable garden in my particular location where that went, it would not have worked well. It was never designed to do that because I was I analyzed my goals first. Think about that as we go through this entire presentation. Next, terrace gardens. This was actually interesting to me because I don't have any terrace gardens here. So I don't have a lot of places. I can just go take a picture for you. So I did the Google actually brave search images thing. And I looked at a lot of terrace gardens and I didn't find any that I would have designed the way they were done. This one's sort of okay. It's sort of okay. Because if you look, it's built with timbers and the timbers are fairly wide. They make a decent pathway. And I'm guessing those beds are roughly three foot deep, maybe four. And you could reach most of the bed from the front side. But you might have to reach some of the bed from the back side using the upper plank as a walkway or space. And when we raise a bed, we have to bend over less. But if you look at accessing that bed from the back side, if this is something you're going to be harvesting and maintaining, you're reaching down. That's more work. So when I design a terrace-based system, I design some of the square footage to be a pathway on the lower terrace. So for instance, what I might have done here is, and maybe I would have ended up with two terraces based on the landform, but I would have made those beds wider and maybe used pavers or something like that so that you had a natural walkway on the backside of those beds. The other thing that I'll tell you about this that I, I, I would not design, if you look at, as you can tell much better in, in the, uh, the side that's in the foreground there, they're terraced, sure enough, but look at the dirt fill. The dirt fills on an angle. It's still coming downhill. That is not how I would design a terrace using this technique. I want the fill flat and level because when water comes down from the upper grade into it, I want it to act like a swale. That's the whole point of a terrace, to reduce erosion. So this actually is going to create erosion because here's what's going to happen. You have a three-tiered terrace for those that are on the audio only. Water is going to land on the upper terrace, and it's, and it's going to come from upgrade. All that lawn that's above there, whatever that lawn can't hold, it's going to spill over to the top terrace. Now, the top plus the top terrace are going to combine and spill over to the mid terrace. And the mid, the top, and the lawn are going to spill over to the bottom terrace, and we're going downhill the entire time. If those terraces are flat and level, as that water spills, it soaks. So it's hard to actually work this system. It looks beautiful, but it's hard to work it. It's hard to harvest it. And it is going to create erosion, which is the exact opposite of what we're putting terraces in to do. So I'm not picking on the designer here. And looking at it, it may not be that big a deal. How much rain do they have? If they never have a major, huge storm event, and for all I know, they put in some drain systems that are going to mitigate it. So I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying, as it looks, not how I would design it, and tactically why the technique is good, but it's not implemented to a strategy in a good tactical way. Um, so that's one thing that mitigates this. The other thing is, if you look at the plants in there, those don't look like vegetables. Those look like perennial flowers and, and such like that that are not going to require a ton of maintenance. 
And so maybe a little bit of weeding. And if one were weeding with a hoe or, uh, or something like that, some sort of weeding implement, then walking those and just taking weeds out would not be that hard. But it would be a much better design system, in my opinion, if we made a pathway in the rear and the front had more pathway as well so that we're not doing balancing beam work going back and forth through there. And another, I'll challenge you now, right? So I bet you if, if this morning you would have Googled, Googled terrace gardens and clicked on images, you would have been like beautiful, 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 beautiful. Now when you when you Google terrace gardens, you go, there's no access. They designed access out of the system. That's bad. You'll see like eight foot long beds, no way to get to the back corner of them. They're up against the hillside and you're reaching down four feet. People do this because they don't think they just, oh, it'll look pretty. And it does. It looks beautiful. But if we want to manage it, if we want to use it to our advantage, we need to design it to serve not just the visual, but the person that's going to do the work as well. And this is often landscapers do things like this because they're not going to maintain it. They just put it in for you. Or if they are going to maintain it, it's all boxwoods and stuff like that where they don't have to worry about harvesting food out of it. If we're talking about harvesting food, we need to think differently. Uh, next, one of my favorite things to pick on with many people in permaculture is the herb spiral. I think an herb spiral can be a fine thing. And an herb spiral is a definite, beautiful thing to use to teach permaculture with. It's why you'll almost never take a permaculture course without an herb spiral in it. My... Caution is just because you always see a thing doesn't mean you particularly want a thing. And I've been on sites and seen many herb spirals that if not properly maintained, become weed spirals. Now, here's how here's how a weed spiral or I'm sorry, an herb spiral does the magic that it does. It creates microclimates and it creates massive amount of edge in a space that would have far less edge. So this is a fairly small structure here. It's probably looking at it four foot across the bottom. And it comes around one full spiral and about a quarter. If that was a ram sword, we call it, what, a one and a quarter, one and a half curls on the ram. Uh, so it'd be a trophy, right? And that might be that might be a double curl if I look at where that mint on the bottom is, in fact. So maybe I've, I've not got a full enough image on it. So that might be a, a double curl there. And what you see is up in the top, I can't tell you what that, that plant is dead center there, but I can tell you the one just to the right of it, that's rosemary. And that's what belongs there. Very hardy, rugged, Mediterranean herb, right up in the top where it's going to get blasted with sun and the most heat all day long. You can see that there's mint in the bottom right hand of the screen and something that might be chives next to the mint. Now, if, if this is designed properly, and I don't know that it is, it's a random picture, it is most likely the case that that mint is on the east side of that herb spiral, assuming it's in North America, because it's going to get morning sun and afternoon shade and mint likes moist and cool. So by getting early morning sun, it gets enough sun to grow well. And then by being on the east side, it gets condensation as the, as the temperature changes. It's in a cooler spot and it's lower. So if we're watering the top and water percolates down, it's going to be the wettest area. This is why we use herb spirals to teach permaculture courses. Because look how much you've already learned if you didn't already know this. And I've only just scratched the surface on what an herb spiral does. We have parsley over there on the left. I, this is why I don't know that it's really a perfect example here. Because to me, parsley probably doesn't really appreciate Western sun. But maybe whatever that herb is on the rear, maybe that's West if that's west, then the, the the mint is north. Okay, that we're now we're now we're starting to work. You see how we get that that flow of our daily energy in there. So driest at the top, the more rugged and hardy, uh, if scaling down and in the sun, and then your your plants that most appreciate moist and cool at the bottom. And then look how much edge there is. Look how much surface area we've stacked. We have probably a four foot ish circle. But we have probably eight foot of bed, two foot wide in that four foot space. And then we have 16 foot of edge, let's say there. So that's why we do this. And we can take the herb spiral to a whole different level. Look at this one. I admit, as much as I'm biased against these things, this, and, and Ron says on that last image, the top might be oregano. Uh, I don't think so. It could be. I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure. Anyway, on this next one, what we have is a similar structure. It's a little bit taller. It's a little bit bigger. And what do we have sitting down, hopefully in the afternoon shade at the very bottom? We have a pond. And that pond, I could be wrong. It looks to me like it's made out of a concrete mixing tray from like Home Depot. It's certainly rectangular. Uh, that would be a little shallower than I'd be comfortable with. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's simply a liner uh, dropped in there. Ben says that last image was maybe lavender. I think you're right. That And that would be a good herb to put up there. So we have the same type of situation here. We have different herbs going all the way up our herb spiral. We have a little frog pond at the bottom. Now, as long as we can do something to keep that pond from turning into a skank pit, we'll do fairly well. What can we do to keep it from turning into a skank pit? Number one, we can provide more shade for it. That would be one thing we can do. We can provide maybe some sort of trail, trailing plant that comes over the side. Uh, for those that can see right, right, right above the pond, there's kind of a sharp wall there. That would be one thing we could do. That would help. Two, we could put a small pump in there. We could put a small pump in there and we could create a little waterfall coming right over that edge. That would be cool. We could take something like uh, some uh, fencing. And we could create an arch that comes right from kind of the outer edge where the pond is going back to that wall and create like a little arch there. And we could plant something outside the herb spiral even or even extend a little footer to the herb spiral there and plant something that would trail up and over that up toward that top tier to provide more shade. We could take something like slate, which would be kind of cool, just a piece of slate, thin, like something you would make flooring out of. And we could cover... 50% of the pond with slate. So it had an underlay. Now, now we got a 50%, 100% shade on the pond. There's a lot of things we can do with that pond. And now what do we have? We have a place that frogs and lizards are going to love. Lizards are going to love this. Why are they going to love it? It's got water. So now I don't have to, I'm a lizard. I don't have to worry about water. I've got the human is so foolish. They've provided me with free water for my entire lizard life. And then I've got all these rocks and these little gaps in there. Especially if I'm like a male fence lizard, I'm going to go right up into this place and I'm going to I'm going to sit up on top of that thing and I'm going to start bobbing my head up and down and flashing my blue uh, on my on my abdomen and advertising for a girl. I got the best place in the house and I'm going to make baby lizards and we got all these places for the baby lizards to hide. Right. This is a fantastically done herb garden, except you got a water feature you're going to have to maintain. So strategically, does this work? And what are the tactics that you maintain that tiny pond with? The smaller a pond, the more work it is to maintain it. The, co the converse, though, is if it does get really skanky, if that is actually a, 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 a concrete mixing tray in there, it only weighs 21 gallons. Dump it and refill it and start it over. Right? If you're in, you know, what about mosquitoes? Gambrusia. There's another technique using fish in the system, right? So we don't, we're not going to grow fish that we're going to eat in that system. But we can throw gambrosia in there, which are basically the North American guppy. We ain't going to have no mosquitoes. And unless we really let that water go bad, they're going to live. And if we keep them in a fish tank and we lose some, we fix it and we put more in there. We can grow taro in there. We can grow arrowhead in there. We can grow uh, Ipamira aquatica in there. We can, we can. So now we have an earth spiral growing aquatic vegetables. We can stack this all we want, but we have to think about how we do it. Because the other thing we've done, we just created a buttload of edge. And if we don't keep that full of, of herbs, weeds will come and weeds will grow. Nature abhors a, vac a, a, vac a vacuum, so it fills it. So we have to think when we use techniques like herb spirals. Next, aquatics. This image is what I call my big Miyagi. This is almost 5,000 gallons of water. It's 12 foot by 12 foot, and it's about three foot high above grade, but it's about a foot below grade, so about four foot of water. And it's done framed in with four by fours. If you take my aquatics course later, you're going to hear about some errors made in the design of this. It's working. It probably will work for many, many years. But I could build this better because I've built one now. And I know that I would put certain reinforcements in it. And I might have even made it a little bit lower on the above grade side. And if I lived in a place where I could dig a hole, I would have only brought it up about two feet. And I would have put it four foot in the ground. However, that's not, that's just an example. Like even an experienced designer, at some point, you're like, I wonder if this will work. 
and you're going to make an investment in time and space and energy. And that's the only way you're going to learn, or you can learn from somebody who's done it already. All right. Moving into aquatics, though, aquatics is a technique. Now, aquatics is a technique, you know, aquaculture is a huge macro technique discipline. In fact, it's why I'm developing a course specifically for it, because there's so much. And when we look at aquatics, we can be looking at anything from a pond this size to that little pond we just looked at, that little 20-gallon pond, to a 10-acre lake system, or 20 quarter-acre lakes, or 28-acre lakes, or 21 20th an acre ponds in a system of, of growing fish. It can be so much. Just putting my course together, it's something like 15 pages is the syllabus, and this is as big as we're going, plus swimming pool conversions. And we have a 15-page. That's not even any information filter. It's a huge discipline. So when we start saying, I want to do aquatics, I want to do aquaculture on my property, we really have to think about what we're saying. Where would you put a pond? I don't know. What's your budget? How big's your property? What's the sun like on your property? What other systems do you want? How is this going to play in with them? What are you going to feed your fish? Is it going to be one pond or multiple ponds, right? Do uh, you want to do one pond with multiple systems attached to it, or do you want a freestanding pond? What are you trying to accomplish? But aquatics, to me, is the thing that we need to spread like a virus through America. And the reason is there is no more sustainable culture in the world than Asian cultures. As far as the way you get outside of the cities, you go into their countryside and you look at the way that people in that part of the world live. It's incredibly sustainable. Now, one thing they have going for them is a huge portion of it lies in the subtropics and the tropics. So they have the ability to grow year round. And they have the ability to grow certain plants that will die in our, you know, in our climates if we don't take extra measures. However, there's a lot of aquaculture in Asia that's done up in the, the, the more northern latitudes where it does freeze. Uh, there's tremendous amounts of rice, for instance. People think of rice as a tropical thing, right? There are tremendous amounts of rice grown in alpine climates in Japan and China using terrace-based aquaculture. See, so again, the techniques combined together. But somebody's saying something really important to understand here when we get into aquaculture. It's a little the same but different, right? Smaller systems equal more work to maintain, but also more control. True. And aquatics, they kind of take that to another level. The smaller an aquatic system is, the more difficult maintaining a proper balance of that system is so that the things that need oxygen have enough oxygen, so the things that produce waste have the waste eliminated with the nitrate, nitrite, nitrate cycle, right? So when we get a really big body of water, we can do absolutely nothing with it. If it's deep enough and big enough, it's a pond. We have ponds all over the freaking world. Nobody does anything to them. Fish and stuff live in them. Sometimes bad climatic things can happen and they can crash, but most of the time, everything maintains itself. Even something the size of this pond right here, if you don't aerate that pond, you'll have dead fish. So if we're going to implement aquatics, we need to think about location heavily. We need to think about, well, what water replaces the water in there? Are we going to use rain catch? Do we have a well? We need to think about power. If we're going to run a pump, whether it's an air pump or a mechanical pump, we need to be able to have some form of energy. Is it going to be solar? What's our solar exposure? What's our budget? So thinking about all of these things and then tying these systems into other systems. And aquatics is one of those things that when you go down that path, all of a sudden it will tie into almost everything that you're doing. Let's move on from there. Hugo culture. I picked this one because there's probably not a system that is more poorly understood. And some of it has to do with one of my favorite people who understands it perfectly. But when you try to explain something like this, a lot gets lost. So if you ask the average person who's been learning about permaculture and homesteading and stuff like that that's been exposed to hugel culture, what is hugel culture? And if they're familiar with it at all, they'll say it's when you take wood and you bury wood and the wood acts as a spongy core and it provides nutrient and moisture to, to help reduce irrigation requirements and grow lots of stuff. Okay. That's a nice answer. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's partially right, right? But overall, it's the wrong answer. 
What does Hoog culture mean? In German, it means hill culture. And so I selected this image because it gives you an idea of a realistic scale. So you see there's a large number of people there. This mound is, I'm going to say, six to eight foot wide at the base. And it's probably about four foot tall. That's a lot of material. That's a lot of material. This project's being done in Michigan. Sepp Holzer himself, who's kind of the granddaddy master of Hugo culture, came to, to North America and did this project. This is being done uh, under Sepp's supervision as you're looking at. This is back in 2013. I was at a project he did. I showed you images of it last week that was much larger than this. The, the mounds were freaking six and a half, seven foot tall. And they were wider and they were bigger and they were huge. And it was over a kilometer of them put in. And he went from that project to this project or this project to that project. I'm not sure of the timeline, but it was all in the same trip. The reason I'm bringing this to you, though, is so you can see how thinking you know what a technique is can lead to improper implementation, in, improper use of the technique. Even if you understand your strategy and your tactics, if you have the technique wrong. So if you look at this, this is... Way different than just about anybody's Hugo culture project I've seen on YouTube. So first of all, you're looking at a big mound and you're seeing about a seven degree, 70 degree angle on the sides. That is a precision thing that's been determined over time to be optimum for this type of, of, of growing. But you also see it's covered, absolutely covered with branches on the top. So what we have is a wood core. We have some organic material turf, whatever we could dig up there. And then we have topsoil piled on top. But then on top of that, we have all these thin branches everywhere. And then they have some big, long, straight wood that would make like good uprights for like a small shed or something. I mean, they're like forearm diameter and they're going across the center all the way down the, uh, the mound. Why? Well, look what's underneath them. There's pegs pushed in to the soil to hold them up. When this bed's done, it's going to be planted with seed and plants. And then it's going to be mulched, probably with straw, but whatever mulch material you have. And all of that infrastructure you see going on the top that will rot away and die, it's designed to hold that, that mulch in place while the mound stabilizes. So if you've done hugo culture and you haven't done this, you've done something with a wood core bed. Too big, too small, the right size, the right angles, maybe, but you haven't done hugo culture the way it was developed as a technique in Germany. Additionally, there's more of those branches set aside, and the students are going to be told to cut sticks that are about six to eight inches long, that have kind of like something that you like a like a branch coming off the side of them, like a tent peg with a point, and those except would call those nails. And they're going to put the mulch on, and then they're going to take more branches and lay it over the mulch and take those nails and push to hold that whole system in place so it's stabilized for a full growing season. That's hugo culture. Everything else is some form of wood core gardening, right, or wood core beds. If we go back to my contour gardens right there, that a lot of people would call hugo culture. This was dug up, a trench. Wood was added to it, and a hill was built over it. But that does not look anything like that, does it? So what I did is in hugo culture. What I did was I took an element from hugo culture, a wood core bed, and I implemented it into a longer-term contour-based system. Right. So that's hugo culture. Let's keep going with this, though. This, again, gives you more scale of the size of it. These are big mounds. This is before all that top dressing went on. Now, if you only ever saw this picture and then you went and tried to do hugo culture, even if you had everything else right in your design, it's not going to work optimally because you're going to have a lot of erosion off that 70-degree bank without those nails, that infrastructure, and the mulch. And if you put mulch on that bed, wood chips, straw, leaves, I don't care what's going to happen the first wind that comes through. Bye-bye, it's gone. But by putting that kind of taking all that slash brush that you would or, or otherwise have to wood chip and end up with a tiny pile of wood chips versus the work you did. Or you would have to burn it off or get rid of it somehow. Now you've implemented it into design. It's going to slowly compost. And the Hugel mound is a giant compost mound. 
It's a very slow natural compost system. In fact, I'll tell you, I'm about to show you some images. And if you look, there's a lot of people that think, well, we take the Hugo mound, we grow trees in it. And the trees grow to mature. 20 years later, the mound is flattened down a little bit, and there's a giant tree growing out of it. Maybe. It's not generally what Sep does. What does Sep do with one of these? Well, he builds them on terraces on the side of a mountain. And after a certain amount of time, he uses them to grow trees, but he generally grows trees for a year or two and then digs them out and either sells them or plants them elsewhere. It's like a nursery for them. And eventually he takes that mound, he takes a piece of heavy equipment, and he flattens it back out across the terrace. And you've just made tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in the highest quality compost that you could ever make. And you've done it with waste material and a little bit of heavy equipment work. And it produced for years in annuals and, and smaller perennials for you, plus it nursed trees. Can you do this and grow trees long term? I did, but I did it differently. And the implementation is critical here. Here's an example. The image on the left is part of one of Paul Wheaton's articles. This is about Google culture. He made that article kind of in anticipation of SEP coming to America for that project that we did in Montana that also did the same project that the images you just saw. When he showed this picture to SEP, he said he felt like a schoolboy that tried really hard that failed his master. And Paul knew what he was doing. This is not really an error on Paul's part. It's just the perception of the person looking at it if they don't understand what I just showed you. Sepp looked at it, shook his hands, and said, no, 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 too much wood. Right? And these, those are large logs. That's actually valuable lumber, even if it's something like a, a low-value spruce. There's something valuable there. If nothing else, it could make uh, a shelter for pigs or something. Right? But... All Paul was trying to convey is the size, the scale, the shape, and what's in it. And when you make graphics like this, you rely on a graphic designer, and you also kind of overstate things so that people understand. That's wood. You want the person to look at it and go, wood, organic matter, grow stuff on top. Big mound, 70-degree angles, right? If you look at the image next to it, this is much more indicative of what's going on. First of all, you'll see that the, the, the wood core is actually below grade. You'll see that the wood core is made up mostly of large slash, not bowl wood. Bowl wood can be firewood. Bowl wood can be timber, right? Bowl wood can be poles for a pole barn. This is like all the big slash. We push it together with something like a bobcat or an excavator. And we also dig out the ground and we take this, the soil that we dig out. And that's that top layer. That's our top soil. We move that out to the sides. That way we're not bringing material in to build a mound. Okay. And then we push all that bowl wood to the center and it needs to make up only about 30% of the total structure. Then we take like all the leaves and all the crap that came off the junk trees that we took down to make all that scrub up. And we took the bowl wood away and we put on a big layer of that. And then we throw on top of it, the topsoil, mostly topsoil. We excavate it out to put the core in. Now, when we get a rain event, one of the reasons that core can help us so much is the water that's below grade that lasts a lot longer than the surface water is going to sponge into that decaying wood core. It's going to sponge through like a wicking bed through that organic matter and make itself accessible to the plants that are out in the topsoil that's on the top. And we're going to grow annuals in there some, yes, but mostly we're going to grow short-term, smaller-scale perennials in this system. And once they get their roots into that core, it's game on especially in the right climate with the right implementation. Now that's Hugo culture. So every time you see somebody on, on YouTube and they say, I'm doing Hugo culture and they take an excavator and they dig a, a trench and they throw wood in it and they put a garden bed on top of it. No, you didn't. I'm not putting it down. I did it in Arkansas. It works great. It's wonderful. I had gardens in Arkansas. I had five and a half foot tall jalapeno pepper plants. They had so many peppers set on them. When it rained, the branches would fall off from how much moisture the weight of the peppers would take up. And it would literally, a branch would fall off and you'd pick up a branch. It looked like a tree branch. And it was a pepper grown the same year. And there was 50 peppers on one branch. So I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying it's not this. It's using an element of this, the wood core. The wood core becomes this amazing sponge, but it also becomes what? Bungle. As long as it's not too deep, as long as it can breathe, 
It is fungus city, and fungus among us is good if we have beneficial fungi in our gardens. People are going out and buying mycorrhizal bacteria. One of the things I did in that wood core garden, when we put the wood in the ground, <clears throat> I got a beneficial fungi, and I inoculated all the wood before we buried it. That's part of why the whole area took off so well. So there's your hugo culture. Next, backyard orchard culture. This was the term anyway. Backyard orchard culture was pioneered by Dave Wilson Nursery. Uh, and this is uh, one of the, uh, the guys from Dave Wilson Nursery in this image. And what backyard orchard culture is, is simply taking trees and keeping them pruned into a bush to small tree size and putting lots of variety in one small place. So we could take a standard backyard that if you put in even like semi-dwarfing rootstock and just let them grow, right, as, as big as they normally grow and prune them the way the book says, you could maybe fit two or three trees in a backyard and they might even be a bit crowded. Or you could maybe fit in 12 or 16 or 24 trees and have plenty of room left over to do other things with. And the way we do that is we, as designers, and implementation of the design and the technique, take personal responsibility for the height of the tree. So you can see in the first image there, uh, they're putting in four trees in an area that's probably smaller than you would put in one tree. And uh, hang in laundry, thank you for the super chat and the five bucks. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, but he put in those four trees very close together. If you look in the second image, those aren't the same trees, but that's the goal. That would be two, three years in. And we have like, it looks like a four trunk bush. It looks like a four trunk bush. And that's kind of what we've turned it into. Why would we do this? So let's say that looks like peaches to me. Let's say we put in one peach tree and we prune it to about the size of, of those four combined. And we keep it backyard sized. We put one tree in, same space. We've done great, right? And we're going to get a ton of peaches. Let's say it's an early Alberta peach. And we're going to get all the peaches at one time in our little backyard. Well, we only get so much fruit. Oh, wait a minute. That's a problem. We have more than we can use. And what if early Alberta gets hit by a late frost and doesn't produce? Wouldn't it be great if we had like a mid-season peach and a late-season peach in there and maybe something in between? That way, if our Alberta gets hammered with a late frost in March, the other three still produce. If everything works perfectly, now we get a small amount of peaches over a much longer period of time. And maybe just over from there, we do the same thing with apples. Maybe just over there, we do the same thing with plums, et cetera. And we maintain that. And we cre create this seasonal cycle of fruit in a much smaller area in our backyard. And honestly, I think the work that Dave Wilson's done is amazing. And I think the guy deserves an award. Now, he's he's profited from it. Now, it's actually his, I think it's actually his grandfather that established Dave Wilson or, uh, Nursery and developed this technique. And it's, the I think, the grandson running it now that's taken it and really turned it into something and made it more, um, uh, more accessible to people. But it's a fantastic, but it's not the only person that's ever done it. And what I want to share with you right now is a video. This comes from something Jeff Lawton put out. It's a tour of a guy's backyard. I believe the backyard is 60 meters square. So it's about 640 square feet. So I, I used to have a studio apartment when I was a young kid. And my apartment was about 600 square feet. So that's how, and this guy's growing tons of stuff. But I want you to see what he's doing with apples and how similar this is with a different layout. So you're not married to the layout. Here we go. Uh, let's play this for you. How did you come across this system? Like, what was the what was the inspiration that you wanted to achieve here? Well, ultimately, um, I wanted to be able to squeeze in as many fruit trees as possible into my backyard. And the whole point of the design was that I can get extended cropping rather than having one big apple that produces all its apples all at once, and then I've got a glut of them. I thought. It, I can get extended cropping by planting an early, mid and late season apple. Now, the catch with that is I'd need a space to put three big trees, but I don't have that much space. So what I've done in this little five metre strip, I've managed to squeeze four trees in. So this is just on a regular rootstock. It's, this is a full size apple tree. So what I've done 
I've planted them very close. They're only about a metre and a half apart from each of the other trees. And so they, they will actually compete with each other for nutrient and water and slow each other down. And we don't go crazy with nitrogen fertilisers, so they don't get heaps of vertical growth. And the other thing, the, the key to all of this is really the pruning. We prune not only once, the usual um, winter prune, but we do a three times a year prune. Whenever we get, this is all hard and woody now, but whenever we get the green growth, we take all the woody, um, we take the green growth down by half. So we leave the woody growth and we take all the green growth down by half. So we trim half of the new growth in spring, then we trim half of the new growth in summer, yeah. and then we do our normal autumn prune. So that helps the tree get bushier and gives it more form and shape, gives it more branches, and we keep it low. I never prune any higher, sorry, I never let it, I never let it grow any taller than what I can reach with secateurs above my head. And, and you're a bit shorter than me. Too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you can have your trees a bit taller. But, um, and these are still um, yet to have their summer prune. I've left them a little bit longer just um, so they can store more energy into their roots. And everything that goes to the ground is chop and drop total. Yep, everything. All the leaves from these will um, go down there. All the um, berries that I prune, they all go into there. Everything goes back into the garden. And there's nothing wrong with the soil. From what I can see, the soil is magnificent. And you're returning diseased leaves and fungus, everything just sorts itself out. Good yeah. organisms win all the time. That's right. So it's a, it, it, it's a self-replicating fertility system. It's just keeping the fertility cycling. That's yeah. right. If you've got a good, healthy soil ecology, it all takes care of itself, just like a good, healthy tummy. We've just got to trust these systems, and this is an endorsement that these systems work. I mean, it's a very small area with an enormous production. One of the reasons why I like to chop things really, really fine is because they break down much quicker and they create nice, rich soil much, much faster. And here what we'll do is we scatter the seeds first. This is all lettuce. So this lettuce will produce our lettuce for next year. So we'll grab that, throw some more over there, spread it out, take that out served its purpose. I normally fold them because I can cut it twice as fast. If your hands are strong enough, you can fold it again. So that's four layers there. And then I can just do it really quick. Okay, and if you like that video, I am actually going to um, provide a link in the uh, show notes of the whole thing. The whole thing's about 30 minutes long and it is a fascinating video, but I wanted to hone in on kind of, you know, what we just learned there. And, and as I said, we're going to have bonuses today. And so we just got a bonus technique, chop and drop. And this is a, this is another one of those things that's largely misunderstood. So chop and drop is most known in permaculture. We put in a large food forest, something more akin to like a zone four food forest. And we have trees coming up to be big overstory trees. And when we chop and drop that, we may go in and chop and drop initially a cover crop that we put in. So we put in swales, we plant our trees, we plant our pioneers and our overstory fruit and nut trees. And then we, we go in and we hit it with like cowpea, uh, lespedeza, uh, ryegrass, whatever, to cover the ground until natural ground cover comes in. And then we'll go back in shortly thereafter with like sickles or size or something. We'll cut all that stuff and put it to the ground and then it will decompose and more will grow and we'll keep doing that. But eventually we'll actually start saying, hey, like we put in 15 legume trees for every one overstory tree. And at the end, we want more of a one to one relationship. So we're going to kill the over. We're going to kill all the pioneer trees over time. We're going to stack in time. So we're going to go in and we're going to cut them. And then they're going to pollard or they're going to cop us back. And then we're going to cut them again. And they're going to pollard or cop us back. And we're going to keep doing this until eventually all the other trees that we're favoring get so tall and fill in so much that the pollarding coppicing basically stops because there's so much shade or the tree's been cut so many times. And if we start timing our cutting and our chopping and dropping to where in the beginning we want it to have regrowth, but we can then start cutting it at a poor time of year for the guy getting cut, right? Remember, I've, I've talked about pruning and yesterday, and I said, pruning, we kind of want to do that when the tree's dormant, like unless we're doing what the guy just did in the video, right? We, we want to prune when the tree's dormant. Well, what if we prune when the tree's active and it's a dry season and it's getting shaded out? 
right? Then it's going to die. It's going to rot and it's going to become fungal food for the forest. So we're not going to go into a big food forest, quarter acre, uh, a third of an acre, uh, 10 acres, and do what he did and fold things and chop them into tiny pieces like we're a miniature chipper shredder. We're not going to do that. We're going to chop big bulky and just throw it to the ground and let nature do its thing. But when we scale it down, we take chop and drop and we change it into what you saw him doing there. And there's another part of that video. He's taking lettuce plants, or I think maybe it was in the part I showed you. And he, he's reseeding lettuce. He's not saving seed. He's reseeding and then chopping and dropping. Right? Like, it's all about you having control and you deciding how you implement these things and how you scale time into them. Next up, um, yeah, I wanted to just, I showed you, I, I added this picture. This is a picture from the video you just saw. And that's, again, that's three full-size apple trees. And somebody asked, do, the, do you use full-size rootstock when you do backyard orchard? It depends. Where do you get your trees from? Most of the trees that Dave Wilson Nursery sells are going to be on semi-dwarf rootstock. So those trees would get much larger than they do with pruning. But I'll tell you, I think the main reason why is the most commonly available rootstocks in the nursery industry are dwarf and semi-dwarf. You won't find a lot of trees on full-size rootstock, especially when they're grafted trees. And Dave Wilson's doing a lot of really cool things like plum quads, which are plum apricot cross and pluots and, and all these other really cool trees that he's developed over the years or his family's developed over the years. And so you're definitely grafting there. My opinion is if you can get full-size rootstock, and you'll do the work that the gentleman in the video I showed you did of pruning and maintaining, you will have a much more robust, stronger tree on full-size rootstock than you will on a dwarfing rootstock. We're dwarfing with pruning. And if we're doing anything other than a full dwarf tree, we're going to have to dwarf with pruning anyway in this method. So why not have the most vigorous, rigorous rootstock you can? that's going to go down as deep as possible to drought-proof the situation the best that you can and maintain that. It's not any harder to prune a full-size tree down. It's going back into type one and two errors. The, 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 the decision to bring a full-size tree in and think you're going to do the work and not do the work has more consequences. It has more consequences. Basically, in this system... If you can't reach it, it needs to be pruned off and it needs to be pruned multiple times a year. But this system is very effective. And I think I'm hoping what a lot of you are taking from today's episode is most of you are not on large property. Most of you are on properties from, you know, 10th acre suburbia to three to five acres. I consider all that in the sweet spot. They are easy properties to design if you accept the limitations that come with them and how much work you're really going to do and design it for yourself and for your activity level and your budget properly. It is much easier to change the soils on a quarter of an acre than it is on 25 acres. Right? We can literally change a quarter or acre of soil with some good amendments, some good compost tea, and a couple truckloads of mulch. We can change it for the good for almost in perpetuity if we if we design the system right. Changing 25 acres of soil, it's not impossible, but it takes a lot more work, right? So just kind of think about it that way. Moving on, composting. This is what I said earlier. We have to think of techniques really in the micro and the macro. Composting is a macro technique. There are so many sub-techniques within composting. Composting is a basic process, though. If we keep organic material with a reasonable ratio of carbon and nitrogen together in a moist, cool environment for long enough, fungi and bacteria will colonize the pile, they will consume the pile, and they will result in something that we call compost. But what kind of compost? I'll tell you a, a secret. Most commercially made compost is not high quality. It's what you use when you have no other choice. In fact, some of it you will find, and there's a lot of people out there that blame herbicides for poor performing commercial compost. In most instances, that's not the problem. In the composting process, if there is a little bit of herbicide or toxic gick or whatever, the composting process itself will lock up those materials. Nature is a cure-all. But what happens is these are massive compost piles. 
They are composted extremely rapidly for the purpose of production. Because they're so large and they're done in such a fast processing, the temperature in them gets very, very, very high. They develop certain fungi that are detrimental to the growth of many of the plants that you want to grow, but they tend to be pretty beneficial to things like brassias. So all, you, you'll get this compost, you'll put it in your bed, and like your, your kale and your broccoli and all will go nuts, and you put your tomato in it, and it just doesn't do well, right? So that's a huge component, and thank you to Mr. OG Point for the super chat, dude. Thank you a lot for that. Um so we want to take control of the compost system we ourselves. And we also want to follow a permaculture principle. Produce no waste. So composting is one way that we harvest waste streams. The compost system that you're looking at that I'm sitting down next to there is kind of sort of like, in a way, a Johnson Sioux bioreactor, which you can look up if you want to. To me, my way causes, requires a lot less effort. And since it requires a lot less effort, I'll do it. It makes really great compost. And the important thing, though, I already said, because it's easy to do, I actually do it. If I had tried to do true Johnson Sioux composting, it wouldn't be done yet this year. And I wouldn't have my compost going this year. And I'd have a waste stream that wasn't harvested. So I'm not putting down what Johnson Sioux does. I'm just saying it's not for me. Another way to compost is worm composting. Is worm composting right for you? Do you have a lot of fire ants where you live? Then it probably isn't unless you can figure out some way to, I don't know, surround it with water or do it indoors in a way that the ants don't find you. Every attempt I have ever made on my property to do worm composting has resulted in the worms being devoured by fire ants and the fire ants invading the worm farm and setting up shop and living there. So it's working great. You go out one day and you pull back all your stuff and there's no worms in there. And you're putting down all your compostables for the worms to eat. And next thing you know, you're getting the shit bit out of you by fire ants. There's 500 million of them in there. So I don't do worm composting. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm tired of fighting it on my, on my property. You can do black soldier fly composting. That's an incredibly good thing. And my understanding of black soldier flies is they're so busy eating stuff. And the chemicals that they put out, like the pheromones they put out, like ants won't go into a black soldier fly uh, composting system. So if we do black soldier fly composting, now we can compost things like meat waste. Where What I'm doing right there will compost. I, I take chicken carcasses, duck carcasses from coals, and they go deep in the center of that thing. And when you dig it up later, it's gone. It's totally gone. But if we do black soldier fly, we can throw that in. They'll literally devour it. We get compost, but we also get the black soldier fly larva as they mature they crawl out. They go into a container. We can feed them to our livestock. We can feed them to our fish. We can freeze them and feed them later. Very high protein, very high fat source, right? So there's so many ways that we can do this. But the most important thing is where we do it, when we do it, and how we do it relative to our lifestyle. I talked about this before, so I'll be brief, but behind me in that image is the chicken coop, duck coop. Behind the chicken duck coop is a pond. The pond grows water plants. There's a little pile that's right in front of the other small building you can see back there of some piled up material from the, the coop. There's a pit there, and it's literally just some old cinder blocks made into a big square with some of the soil dug out and excess material that I don't have time to compost yet. All my kitchen scraps and all the water plants that are feed for the livestock go in that pit. I don't barely have to move to do the, 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 um, the water plants. I have a pitchfork. I pick it up and I just throw just throw it over the fence. The ducks can't interfere with the pond. All those compostables are there. And then all of the bedding from the deep litter bedding we do in the coop is in that coop. So I go out there every morning. That gives me a chance if the compost piles need to be wet down a little bit. There's a hose right there to do it with. The, the aquatic system ties into the compost material accumulation. And everything's located to where I'm going to deal with it every day. Because it's like not the most exciting thing in the world, making compost. So it's designed into the system very tightly. So one way or another, you need composting. Does this system make sense for you? Maybe not. Because I'm going to tell you, if you live in a backyard and your chickens are four little laying hens and you have a little coop that you can roll around or something like that, you're probably not going to produce enough material to do this type of composting. 
you might do a miniature version. I do the exact same thing. I take a 32 gallon trash can. I take one of those pipes with a bunch of holes in it, put it down the center. I drill holes in the bottom and the top of the trash can. If you're MSB, there's an old video in there showing how to do this. And you just fill it up with waste. And when it gets full, you dig another trash can and you fill it up with waste. By the time you fill the second trash can at like urban scale, the first one will have collapsed down to about half its size. You pull the pipe out, you dump it into a third trash can, it's ready to use. And you start building that one up again. And you just keep those three rotating. Why do you do this? Because if you try to do a large pile like this, when you have small amounts of waste over time, you're baking a cake, you put up one quarter of the batter in, you baked it for 15 minutes, then you added batter and baked it again. Then you mix it up, added batter and baked it again. And then you have overcooked, undercooked, it doesn't work. So you have to adapt your composting to your waste stream, to your lifestyle, and to your overall design if you're going to do it right. Next up, wicking beds. So here's a picture of some of my wicking beds. I shared this one with you before, but those are 100-gallon Rubbermaid tubs. The bottom is simply lined with material that is uh, like coarse lava rock. Then we have two layers of uh, weed blocker, double layer of weed blocker. Then we have a layer of perlite. Then we have a good soil mixture coming up from the top. And then there's an inflow and there's an overflow. And I'm really not going to explain that because I have a video for you next that will explain it in a different system. But the advantages of wicking beds, if you are a busy person, if you are not going to take care of seeing to the irrigation of your garden as well as you should, if you live in a climate that when soil dries out, it really dries out, plants really suffer, they become stunted. And even when you water, it takes a long time to rehydrate the soil once that's happened. Wicking breads are probably right for you if you can design them right into your system, right? That is that is a great way to do things. And I'm going to back up here for a second. Um, David says, uh, rabbit hutch over compost bin for hot compost. It's a great technique if you have rabbits and if you have a system designed to do it. Um, wicking beds, again, you just never have to worry about them if you automate the process. And with that in mind, let me just see what my next slide is. Yeah, that's what I thought. I want to go ahead and I want to show you a video I shot for you this morning. It's a different wicking bed, but I think this will explain how wicking beds work a little bit better for you. So guys, just a quick video today to go with my presentation. I wanted to talk to you about wicking beds as part of the presentation today. So I want to show you an alternative style of wicking bed. And this is actually really easy to understand. The first thing I want you to notice, if you didn't look at the pipes, it looks like any other you know, sort of container-based raised bed. This is actually receiving its water from this little 300 gallon pond system. It's also running those aquaponics beds that aren't really important to this today. And you can see right there, that big pipe and that pipe coming over, that's taking the excess pressure from the pump because it's a fairly large pump. And that's the primary aeration source of this pond. So there's plenty of pressure left then to feed these four wicking beds. And all that's happening is water's coming in here this pipe goes all the way to the bottom and it has a series of holes in it that allows water to fill the bottom of this bed. You can't really see the size side of it, but these are about 20 inches deep and they're about seven inches full of coarse rock and, and porous pipe. Then there's a layer of about and two inches of perlite and between the layer of perlite and the rock underneath there is a double layer of weed blocker. And then it's just a good soil mix that includes uh, compost, a little bit of a lava sand, some expanded shale, and just general organic matter to create a good wicking sponge. And then every year we top it with new compost. This bed is dedicated 100% to growing comfrey. Uh, it's pretty cold out today. We're just coming into spring now. So you can see it's just coming back from its dormancy in the winter. So the water comes in there, it goes out right down there. That's how that works. There's an overflow pipe. Water comes in, water goes out. This is what we call a continuous flow wicking bed. And that that pump is always on and that water is constantly flowing through the bed. My friend David and I came up with this design, building large aquaponic systems, because since it's continuous flow, it's excellent for filtration because all that rock and pipe down there is building, uh, has has uh, beneficial bacteria that do the nitrite, nitrate, convert nitrate, nitrite conversion as that water comes through. However, it doesn't have to be this way. Let's go over here and look at, we got some rain yesterday. Look what happened to the grass guys, even here in March. So, so this, and there is, uh, 
Another one of my aquatic systems. This is a time-based wicking bed. It's a small 21 gallon container. This one's only full about that much with uh, coarse matter. Then it's got a double layer of the weed blocker. And since it's such a shallow system, I didn't use the perlite in this one. So it's just uh, coarse rock. And then the level is set by the overflow. You have your input here. Overflow comes out down there at the bottom. You see that pipe right there? That's where the, let me see if I can get a better shot of that for you. That pipe right there, that's where the overflow comes out. You notice nothing's coming out of it right now. Why? So this system's on a timer. There's a timer and a, uh, the system's plugged into AC inside this building right here. And that timer at 15 minutes, one time a day comes on, it runs water, it overflows, and it stops. It doesn't come on till the next day. What that does is wherever I set the level of this overflow pipe in here, that overflow pipe right there, you can see the level is dead level to the top. So what happens is it maintains that level. During the day, it'll take the level down a bit, kicks on, boom, brings it back up. Now here's the interesting thing. Yes, this is a large system. There's three 170 uh, gallon tanks plumbed together. They overflow to a 470 and down to another 470. Okay, great. What if you don't want all that? You could have any form of reservoir uh, below your beds and then have a float valve to that, setting the bottom end of it, plumbed into a well or plumbed into just water to your property and you could run this same system. Today's lesson is all about technique. That's a technique, a wicking bed. The micro within a technique, the sub technique, there is a timed auto filling wicking bed. That's the sub technique the tactic where it's implemented. In this case, it's implemented as part of an aquatic system and it's growing a very rare form of mint that I can then clone and sell, right? That's part of the overriding strategy of the property. Hopefully that makes sense in the context of today's uh, lesson. And again, what I want you to do is think about, you just saw two different ways to do this and in the slide deck, I gave you a totally different way to do this. So you have the technique wicking bed, you have the sub technique timed or flow through in the case of that one over there and then you have how does it fit tactically within the strategy of the whole property all right so i hope that makes sense and i hope those of you that are in the uh in the audio only it it, it didn't rely too much on visuals there but again uh you can find the video later you can just jump ahead to that particular uh scene and you can get the slide deck in the audio notes as well. So uh, wicking beds are just one of those things I think we need to teach more in permaculture. And there's so many ways to do it. Those were some complex designs, even though they're actually pretty easy to do. But um, I'll tell you, the, the, the system you're looking at now is a whole row of those flow through wicking beds. Back when I used to do aquaponics in this system, and this was a bad design. These were on uh, stands that designed to elevate them so that it would return to the aquaponic system that's in the greenhouse at, at the end of this uh, aviary. And this is something we forced to work to test it, and we really shouldn't have done it. It was spent way too much money on it, and I completely changed the design now. All those uh, beds are still wicking beds. They now sit a couple inches into the ground, so they're even lower. So they're, if you know how big a 100-gallon Rubbermaid stock tank is, they come up to about your thighs. That gives them a lot of overhead growth. The back wall in that aviary is about nine foot tall. So now they have lots of room for tomatoes and peppers and stuff to grow upward uh, in that system. But now all they have is they have a downward fill spot, and where the bulkhead is and the bottom of those bulkheads, I can maybe get some imagery for you this guys later. There's just a... Uh, a a threaded adapter that goes into them and then a piece of one and a quarter inch pipe that comes out with an elbow and comes up. And the height of that pipe is where they overflow. So you stick a hose in the back pipe, you turn it on, you run water into them until it overflows. You shut, you move, you go to the next one, you fill them all up. They're good for a week. And the higher that outside pipe is, the higher your overflow system is in the video you just saw in the early season. When I want those beds wetter, when plants are getting established, I take a, uh, a, a straight adapter for the size of PZ, PVC pipe that the overflow is. And I stick it down in that media excluder and I just barely set it on top of there. That brings the water up another inch and a half. If I wanted it higher, I could put a piece of pipe on there. You want to really see how cool these things are. So if you're using a return system, shut your return line off. So you're not flooding your return line when you do this. Take a piece of pipe 
or a cap so that your wicking bed will literally fill to the top. This is if you're growing annuals, okay? Fill it until it's literally soaked to the top. Leave it for a week. Leave it for a week. What you've just done, you've killed it. It's like a rice paddy. You just killed all the weeds. If there's any weeds that can grow in that system, they'll be going nuts. They'll be the only thing alive in there. Pull them out, drain it, let it sit for a couple of weeks, and plant your next crop into it. You'll never. So when it gets invaded by grasses, because it will, because grass seed blows, you can kill all your grass seed during your winter season by flooding the system. And then when you seed it, and you don't want the top to be dry, bring the water level down so you're, you know, you're maybe four inches from the surface. When your seeds sprout and they begin to put roots down, drop it back down to your, your regular level. Or drop it down a little at a time so your seed roots chase the water level and put deep, deep roots into the system. This is the easiest way to grow food. Look at the image in front of you, those that can see it. There is so much. I use this to talk about layers, and layers not always having to be in a forest before. But look at the amount of production. That's April. That's early April two years ago in that system before I converted it over. There is, there's 30 species growing in there in eight beds. And it's stacked. And some of them in the back, you can see the tomatoes. So many of those by June, they're coming out, they're done, they're harvested, or they just can't handle the heat anymore. And then the tomatoes take over and grow across the hole above. And when you walk in there, you pick tomatoes from above your head until the tomato blight hits. And then the tomatillos take over and the peppers take over, right? And this is all the easiest thing in the world to maintain. I can send my grandson out there once he's been taught how to do it and say, fill them all up. Twice a week, there's no way those plants are ever going to go into drought. I don't care how little rain we get. That's one way to implement wicking beds. And the implementation is key here, right? Last technique I'm going to give you today is greenhouse growing. I'm not going to talk that much about it. I just want to point out that I, I, I added something to the slide. It says greenhouse, parentheses, protected growing. So we always think about greenhouses, and this is more accurately a high tunnel system here. You can see the sides are rolled up because it's later in the season for this person. But by closing the ends and bringing it all the way down, we can grow in much colder weather. But what if you live in Texas, North Texas, like I do, and you put in a system like this? It's very helpful in the winter. We have, and this year was a cold winter. It wasn't a harsh winter, but it's actually been very beneficial that it stayed cold from like Christmas till just last week. And when I say cold, I'm talking a lot of days in the 50s, but cold for us. So the trees and the perennials stayed dormant and we didn't get early bud out. So that's been great. But today it's cold. I mean, it's cold enough that you, I put a, a real coat on when I went outside with the wind and all to do that video. But Saturday when my wife and I were planting trees, it was 88 degrees and we were sweating. So we are heading for that time of year when we are going to get warmer than we want to be. With that same structure, can we not throw shade cloth on there? Maybe 30%. So now we have one structure that extends our season in winter and mitigates our hot temperature in the summer. And it's it's not done like a conventional greenhouse, is it? For those who can see the image. That's not a not your garden here and your greenhouse is over there. They built the greenhouse right in the middle of the garden. Why? Because that's where they grow the food. So instead of starting a plant, a little bee pot in the greenhouse and then carrying it over the garden and putting it through transplant shock, they are just growing it straight in the garden. Here's another thing. Did you know that most people that build these for themselves use the galvanized steel that we make uh, chain link fencing out of, the rails? And there's a tool you can buy. I'll see if I can find a link for it where you can bend your own. And if unlike me, you can actually put pipe in the ground, you can set the bottom pipes in the ground and the top ones just stick on. And if you don't need this and you don't want the rails in your way during your spring, summer, early fall growing season, you just pull the rails up, put some kind of cap on the pipes that are in the ground so they don't fill up with dirt and you don't stab yourself with them and put those rails away. And they'll pack away in a little bit of area, roll your plastic up and put it away. Or if you're in a hot climate like mine, take your plastic, roll up the sides like it's doing right there, and then put your shade cloth over it. And now what happens? You get plenty of moisture 
when it rains or when you irrigate, you reduce evaporation. But when it rains, this is where you put your more tender plants so they don't get the crap beat out of them. At least under this area, if you got hit with hail, I would say with this garden, 50% of your garden was protected from hail. See how many ways this one technique can be used? We could put geothermal under there, right? So we could actually have pipes that take in heat and pump it underground with a fan that you can run a computer with. The little fan in your computer, you can have some pipes running underneath that bed with a little bit of solar collecting heat in the warm parts of the year and bringing the heat down to the ground and warming the entire ground and then close that system down as you go into winter and have greater longevity with your heat battery. We could take that, make it a bigger greenhouse, do a full-on grow inside greenhouse, go back to these Johnson Sioux like compost pits of mine right here. And then in December, build one of those in the middle of your greenhouse. In January, build another one. In February, build another one. And in March, build another one. And these get up to about 150 degrees and they vent heat out of the holes that you see those pipes in. Now, actually, once that, that compost has been made for about three or four days, you pull the pipe out and reuse it on the next one. The hole stays open. But when I went out this morning, that particular pile is now like over a month old. And it was cold enough today that I was watching steam rise out of the hole. What's that do for your greenhouse? You see how the techniques go together if we think tactically. It's really important. And that's why I waited so long to start getting these techniques to you. It's the exciting stuff. It's the stuff you want to do. It's the stuff you look at and go, I can do that. And there's so much power in looking at a thing and saying, I can do that. And then going out and implement it. But if you, if you don't do it right, it's misplaced energy. And it leads to problems. And you end up being one of these people that say, permaculture sucks. I tried it and it didn't work. Well, you tried a technique improperly implemented in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong tactics or absent tactics and absent overall strategy. You did a thing and you 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 miss you misunderstood. It's not your fault. The teacher, and I've gotten to be so much better of a teacher. I used to lead with techniques. I won't do it anymore. I led with techniques because I wanted action. I wanted to see my people go out and do a thing. And I wanted them excited. I wanted them full of the same passion that I had. And I realized over time, just because I understood the limitations of the technique and I understood the time and space and function stacking didn't mean that was understood. And I had to temper the technique. If you came into me and I was teaching you martial arts and I taught you to throw, throw, throw a devastating punch and I actually made you able, and it's not that hard to really teach somebody to throw an incredibly powerful strike. But you don't know how to block, defend, when you should throw a punch, when you should hold back, where you should strike, when you, sh when you shouldn't. You're going to go out and get your ass kicked. Doesn't matter that you can throw a punch stronger than the guy against you. You don't know how to fight. You don't know to throw a punch. And that's what teaching these techniques like are. It's like teaching somebody how to throw a punch and then thinking you've taught them how to fight. So you teach somebody a technique and you think you've taught them how to design. You haven't. You, you, you have to, 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 to have some temperance in this. And it's why I've taken so long. So let's talk about getting tactical. How do we keep this all in mind? It's actually not that complicated. Determine the connections between systems. So likely today you learn some techniques that like, I know right where that would go. Maybe you're right. But remember what I said before about creating connections, make bubble diagrams. Every single element that you think about putting onto a property, don't start with where it goes. Start with what it connects to and how it connects. So composting. I like Jack's method of composting. Whatever the hell you call it. Johnson Sue like. Johnson Sue light. Right? I think that's you have enough material. You have the budget. You have the time. It makes sense to you. Okay. That's what you want to do. So just write composting Jack style. Right? Uh, you decide you want to keep poultry and you decide you want to keep ducks and chickens. Is that right? I don't know. But assume you're right down ducks and chickens. Is there a connection there? Yes. Draw a line between. What about your personal waste stream from your kitchen? Where does it go? Where is your gar What kind of gardening are you attracted to? Is it right? Put it through an analysis. Assume it is. Put in, you know, raised bed gardens or wicking bed gardens. What does it connect to? 
You want aquatics? I want to put in a pond. Great. Figure out what kind, where, size, structure, et cetera. But what does it connect to first? Because a lot of these connect, or a lot of these questions about where do I put it? Where does it go? Where does it belong in the system? Are related to what does it connect to? Because if two elements should be connected in a system, a good designer will never design the connection out. You'll design the connection in in a logical flow. And this is, again, why somebody walks on your property or you bring me a question. I'm like, you do this, 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 and this, and you put it together this way. It's just that I've looked at it long enough, and I've done it long enough, and I've been exposed to all the techniques we covered today and a you know a couple dozen more. And so it's a natural thing that when I start thinking about you, your actions, your daily life, how like what fits your goals, and you'll be able to do this. You'll be able to do this better than you think, faster than you think, if you're willing to just take enough of a rewind back to sit down and draw out your goals and your strategy and, and think about how they fit together. And then integrate those systems and stack function, right? So, it you know, it, I'm stacking a function, for instance, with my pond that grows an aquatic plant called water hyacinth that the ducks eat with the function of composting by locating them close together, by seeing that connection, and by making the effort as limited as possible. If there was a way that some animal, like a monkey, would go out there and throw 20 of those water hyacinths in the bin for me every day, I'd get a monkey, right? And I wouldn't have to do the monkey's job. But I think a monkey's worth not, not worth the trouble to have that done for me. So I go out there a couple times a week in the high season with a pitchfork and I just throw some over and it's a balance between how much do they want to eat and how much surface area do I want to open on the pond to feed the catfish, right? But that's an integrated system that stacks functionality. The coop has power. So it's also a great place for the, for the water system to go because it needs a pump. So integrate your systems to stack your functions. Eliminate labor via automation and natural processes. Think about my wicking beds. I, I'm still figuring out what I want to do with the wicking beds in the aviary to automate them. But all my other wicking beds are connected to ponds. They either run continuous, automated, or they're on a timer, automated. I never water them. I never go out. Like Sometimes I go out to my garden and go, shit, look at those plants. They're stressed. They're stressed. They haven't been watered. That tomato, that, that cucumber is going to be bitter because it's if you ever eat cucumber and it's bitter – and it's otherwise a good-looking cucumber. It's stressed. It's 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 water stress that always causes really really bitter cucumber, right? So like, oh crap, I've, I've ruined that, right? Like I I I need I need to try to take corrective action. Automated wicking bed, never touch it. So automate systems or use a natural process. For instance, it's much better that my straw be chopped into small pieces of straw when it goes into the compost than it be in big long straws when it goes into the compost. So how do I do that? Well, I, I use it as a deep litter in the coop. And as soon as I put new straw in the next layer, the chickens just tear it up. And they, it's look, somebody went in there and cut it. It's also great if I have wood chips mixed in with my straw and my chicken manure. So what do I do? I, I take a wheelbarrow and I bring a couple wheelbarrows of wood chips from the uh, tree trimmers that they drop off here. And I put it in my coop whenever I add, add straw. Now they want the straw. The straw has more interesting things in it, so they incorporate it. So when I wreck out the coop, it's already incorporated. Anywhere I can make the animals do the work, I'm going to do that. Right now, I'm getting ready to extend my coop to have kind of an outdoor, uh, kind of like an aviary attached to the coop. So they have an indoor, outdoor space and more square footage for the deep litter. What I need to do is lower the uh, area, though, so that the, the door on the coop can open. And I can still have deep litter down there. So I also need dirt. So I'm digging out in front of the coop. I'm using the dirt elsewhere. And I end up with like big clumps of black gumbo and stuff like that, right, in front of the, the coop. It's actually pretty good because the birds have been there so long and the mulch has been there so long. But it all needs to be flattened out, leveled, and all those clumps need to be broken up. So what do I do? Every time I'm done digging part of it and using it, I go get a couple handfuls of chicken scratch and I throw it in the dirt and I, I show the chickens it. And they start scratching, and they actually are spreading out and leveling the space for me. So you can use mechanical automation, or you can use natural processes to do work for you. And then consider restrictions based on the scale of permanence. 
this is one of the really important things that we want to look at. I have a, I have a slide breaking this out alone for it. Uh, Water for Eddie Farm uh, book on 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 dealing with, uh, you know, basically uh, using key line plowing systems. But this applies anywhere. And what we're looking at in the scale of permanence is, well, how hard is it to change a thing? Right. How hard is it to make something go away or change its nature? And you see at the top of the scale of permanence, which has the greatest effect and is the most difficult to change. And in this case, it's literally impossible to change your climate. Your property is where your property is. If you live in the mountains of Washington, you're going to have cold winters. If you live on a tropical island, it's never going to freeze. You can't change that. If you have money and you move, you can change your location. But what you left behind, the climate is what the climate is. Coming down from there is land shape or land form. Now, when I was a young student in permaculture, I used to try to break things my instructors taught me. So the first time I heard Bill Mullison say, you really can't change land form. And I thought, oh, well, no, you can change land form. And I get what you're saying. The amount of money to alter the land form and the amount of material you have to move is prohibitive. And it's not what we should be doing in permaculture. But give me a quarter acre backyard, a couple dump trucks of dirt and tell me what land form you want. And I will give it to you. I was right. But in my arrogance, I was also wrong. Why? Well, friends and neighbors, because in the end, I haven't changed my climate. I haven't moved my location. And where I am is still in the same landform. Think of it like this. You have a fish tank in your house. You've set up all kinds of artistry in the fish tank. The fish tank still is within your house. So your little suburban backyard, you can change the way water flows with landform. You can put in terraces, et cetera. But if you're in a valley, you're still in a valley. If you're on a ridge, you're still on a ridge in the greater macro of the landscape. And you really can't change that very much. And it's important to understand. The next is water. And we're not just talking about where the water is, but how the water moves. Now we've actually moved into a place where we can begin to alter things. We can put in a swale and the water that used to just race we can put in ponds and water that used to race off the property can spread in the swale and fill the pond, whether we're doing it with a little bitty garden pond or a great big impoundment. Then we move to roads and access. Once we put a road in, we can change it, but it takes effort. In a backyard, it might be a footpath. If we put a footpath in a backyard, we can change it. It's less of a problem than a half mile road. But it's still a significant investment in time, money, and energy. It becomes more permanent as we go. Then we move on to trees. Trees live a long time. Trees have a major effect. If I put a tree in a place and 10 years later it's shading my garden out, I should have foresaw that that was going to occur. Or if I have heavy winds coming from a specific area and I put the right kinds of trees in, I can block those winds. Do I want to? Once I put that tree in place, it's a difficult thing to change. It's a more permanent thing. Then we move to structures. Once we put a building in, I actually disagree with this. Far be it for me to disagree with the yeoman, but I see a structure as being more permanent than a tree. Unless you have some ethical qualms with a chainsaw, I can make a tree go away. Now, I, the thing is, I've lost all of the growth of that tree, but I can chainsaw a tree. I can prune a tree. I can open up a tree canopy and let more light in. I can change my mind about trees easier than a house. If it's a shed, I can pick up with a forklift. It's pretty portable. But if it's a house? So I think those two are pretty close to each other, so I won't overdo that. Then we have our subdivisions. Now, when we think of subdivision in our, our world, what do we think of? We think of a place where a bunch of yuppies live, right? Subdivision. That's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about how we divide the zones and the flow of the property. And then the last thing on that uh, list is soils, right? And because soil is actually the easiest thing to change. It's the one that we all think is most difficult if we have bad soils, but we can change soil with mulch. We can change soil with compost. We can change soils 
change soil with cultivation techniques. We can change soil with key line plowing. We can change soils with the landform earthworks that we're going to do. There's all kinds of ways to change soil. Small property chicken tractors can completely alter soil in a single season to the better or the worse if we do it wrong. But what I, that's, the, that's what's known as the key line scale of permanence. And I have an article and a video you can watch on it in the audio notes for you as well. But I want you to think about it a little bit differently than just as it's taught for key line. I want you to start looking at your property and saying, this thing that's here, how hard is it to change? You know what's not on this list? Regulation. Regulation is high in the scale of permanence. You have to go beg somebody to change a law. Good luck. It can be done, but it's far more difficult than I want a garden bed there. So anything that already is, you have to kind of rank it in your mind. How hard is this to change? Maybe you've chosen the wrong property. Maybe what you need to change to do what you want is so hard, you're better off selling the property or even developing the property to the point where you sell it for more money, flipping it and getting into a place that works better for you and your goals. There's nothing wrong with that. That might even be a good permaculture property, but not for you. Maybe it's a good permaculture property because you become good at what you do to develop and sell to somebody else and make a profit. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Now the property is set to go for somebody that has a different goal than you do. Phrase. You don't want 40 acres. You want four. You want a bunch of fishing ponds and a cabin. Develop the 40 acres into good grazing land and lease it to somebody. Take the lease fees and go buy another property to develop for yourself. There's a lot of ways to handle it, but regulation is hard to change. Fencing. There's two kinds of fence, right? I know there's like a hundred, but there's really two kinds of fence, temporary and permanent. Joel Salatin's rule, never put in a permanent fence until you had a temporary one there for two years and you're still happy with it. I don't know if I completely agree with that. I'm pretty happy putting a permanent perimeter fence up around any property if I have the money and the budget and the time, right? But he's making a point. Fencing is a pain in the ass to change. It's high on the scale of permanence. Anything that ranks, let's say if you gave it a score of one to 10 and it's above a five, requires more thought before you do it to avoid the type one error. Remember, you were sure you should do it. Then you did it. So it's a false positive. Now you have to live with it or have extreme expense and energy to change it. A type two error, you should have done it, but you didn't. As long as we don't make a type one error because of it, we can always add it later. Think before you act is kind of what I'm getting at here. Now, how do you come up with your strategy? We're finishing with this. Maybe I should have started it with. But your overriding strategy is incredibly important. And it's where all of this comes from. And to me, it's just a series of six questions. What do you need from your property? Let's start off with that. What do I need? Because you might need some things you're not really thinking of right now. One of the things you'll need is you need an exit strategy. You need your property to be designed in such a way that you don't so limit your market that you have to sell your property for less than it's worth if you need to leave. That's one thing you need as a property owner. And if you're doing this as a consultant and you're helping somebody else, whether they know it or not, I don't care how much they tell you they're going to live and die on that property, they need that too. They need an exit strategy. You might need a certain amount of income from the property, or you're going to lose it. That could be with a tenant. It could be leasing land to a grazer if the grazer knows what they're doing. And if you design a system that makes it easy for a grazer to do what they're doing, they'll do it. Like if you don't want to maintain grazing animals, you can do a lease with a large property and you develop a laneway and paddock shift system. And when you bring somebody in there to lease that land to graze, if you've done a good job, once you explain it to them, they're going to be like, oh, you can get more money now. You can get more money for that grazing property. You see how that works? So you need to figure out what you need. Those go under needs first. Now, once we've established the needs and we've made sure our strategy will incorporate the needs, what do you want? Most of you probably want beauty. You probably want a property worthy of handing down to your, your future generations if you don't exercise your exit strategy. You probably want a certain amount of food and calories to come off your property. There's probably a lot. I don't know what you want because I'm not you, but we establish our wants. Then we're going to ask ourselves a different question. What do I like? 
What do I like? Want and like is a similar thing, but it's not exactly the same. What do you like? Because what do you like has a lot to do with, well, do you like manual labor? Right? That's not really a want. That's more of a like. I like manual. I don't like manual labor. Do you want to work 20 hours a week on your property or do you want to work five hours a week on your property? There's gonna What you like and what you don't like is going to play into that, but it's not just what you like because it might be your time limitation. But if you actually like work, you'll probably find the time to do it one way or another. What do you like to eat? What, you know, what do you like to drink? What do you like to do with your time? If you really like something that would require some open space to practice, say golf, not my thing, but you might want to actually design golf recreation into what you're doing. Maybe not a full course, maybe not even a hole, but maybe a putting area or maybe a pitching area. I don't know. I don't play golf. What do you like? Come up with a list of the things that you like and put down anything. Even if you don't think it applies to your property, you might find that it does in time. Then the other question, what do you hate? What do you hate? If you hate something, don't grow it. If you hate doing a certain task, don't put a thing that requires that task into your property because it won't get done properly and it will become a problem. How much time do you have? And be honest. And your initial answer, you probably cut it in half. You're like, I have 20 hours a week. You have 10. You have to treat yourself like a lawyer or a doctor would treat you. My client's lying to me and I need to cut all their answers in half, right? And if you're wrong and you're wrong to the conservative side, you'll be fine. You can add more later. And what realities are you ignoring? I ignored the rock on this property to a high degree when I started with it. I really did. And it's bit me. I tried to do things that really weren't very doable here. I've learned from it. I've adapted to it. And I'm glad I did because it taught me how to adapt. But I, you know, I have a different strategy than most of you do. My strategy, my overriding goal, the thing I want this property to be is an educational property. I want that one time a year where there's 90 freaking people here to be able to walk them around and go, you can do that. Well, I can't do that. Well, then you can do this, or then you can do this, or then you can do that. It's not as tightly connected as I would design it for a customer if I was doing consulting. It's more spread out. It's making use of multiple systems where I would really have one big integrated system because my strategy is different. Part of my strategy is I want to make a profit. That's where the ducks come in, right? I would have less ducks if we couldn't didn't have a marketable product that came from them. I want to build fertility and soil. I want to show an example of what can be done, but I want beauty. I want lots of places when I walk around. I have a small property. It's three acres and two of it's actually developed. And it's really more like one and a half. But geez, you walk through the parts that are developed and you spend all day. I want that. Maybe you don't. You have to define your strategy. And you should be able to define your strategy in one to three sentences. And I challenge you to do it in one. And once you have your strategy, then you start selecting your techniques and your tactics to implement it. And then you start to get somewhere. And you'll find your first designs are never your best. But if you follow what I gave you today and the two episodes leading up to this and the next two that I'm going to do for you next week and the following week, you can go so far so fast. You don't need to sit down and design a property the way you do at the end of a PDC with your project with all kinds of colored pencils and little circles for trees and everything to scale and things like that. You don't have to do that. What you need, and Ron used the perfect, perfect term, and I was going to get there. But thank you for getting there, Ron. You need a mission statement. You need a mission statement. This is exactly what I did as a consultant for businesses. I would walk into a company, big company, successful, millions of dollars in sales a year. What do you do? And I'd usually have this great big conference table I'd be sitting at with all these people, all the stakeholders in the situation. They didn't know what they did. Well, we do this and we do so many things, blah, 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 blah. And their marketing person is like, we do this and this and this. And they, nobody knew what they did. And I would have to just let them go for a while until they started arguing. Because if I said what I was going to say before I let them argue so they could see their own problem, they'd throw me out of the building. And I'd finally, I'd sit there kind of, you know, my fingers to my chin like I'm doing right here on the video and go, so y'all don't know what you do. Y'all don't really know what you do. And that's why you're having, that's why I'm here. And sometimes they get pissed, but they would also kind of at that point when you had six people that are all in charge of different parts of the company fighting with each other about what they did, they kind of had to admit, 
at least, well, maybe I know, but th those other five guys don't. And we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we're going to, no, you're not going to do anything. We need to figure out what you do now to build a mission statement on. And then how do you, once we know what you do, we can talk about how you get to the next things that you want to do. And then we can build a tight, focused mission and marketing statement that your market will understand. And if you don't understand it, how, how are they going to understand it? This is what we do with a property. We develop a tight, focused agenda for the property. And then we go into the quiver and we pull out the arrows and we go, the composting is going to be this kind of compost. And it goes in that spot. And then we think about the scale of permanence and we go, since I could be wrong, let's not build some sort of permanent composting system here. Let's make something that if I change my mind or my method, if I change the technique, it's easy. Let's do things as impermanent as possible unless we're sure or we don't have a choice. Then we remain flexible. And that way we can try out the idea and say, this is or is not working. And here's how I'm going to shift it. I've made tons of design changes on my own property over the years. Many of you have seen them. With that, let's go ahead. I am going to take some questions now. I've got about eight items start. I have no idea what they say because if I see caps, I just do it. If you have any other questions, let's go ahead and uh, put them in and I'll come back and do one more round if we have time. All caps, at least the first couple letters, and I'll come back to you. Uh, Heirloom and Heritage says, question, would you ever add Toba Hoogle? We started at six feet tall and after four years, I'm down to two to three feet. Uh, I think you're probably, I, I don't know who, to, I don't know what Toba Hoogle is. Um, now, starting at a six foot tall mound, and ending up at two to three feet is not that out of the ordinary, but that's that's probably more than you should expect. That's probably a bigger wood core than you should have had, but they should kind of flatten. And if you would have said you started at six and you ended at four, I'd say you're kind of dead on target, but I don't know what a Toba Hoogle is. Um I have no idea what that is, so I, I can't really answer it. If you're still here and you comment in all caps when I come back around, I'll try to figure that out. Would hugel be great for growing mushrooms? No. You might get some mushrooms out of it, but it's not really a mushroom growing system. Hugel cultures are mostly small, short-term, perennial growing systems that can be annually cropped at the same time. If you get mushrooms as a byproduct, great. Um, now you can use mushroom growing and I meant to mention this with my composting. So here's how we can use an adaptive technique. One, I, I wouldn't hesitate to throw some wine cap mushrooms. And I think somebody mentioned those later, uh, in a hugel core, and maybe you'll get some, some mushrooms out of that. That's a pretty big place for mycelium to get all the way to the surface though. The compost system that I'm using, this kind of adapted version of Johnson Sioux. What they do, they build much taller ones and they have to climb up on a ladder and dump it in and I ain't doing that. But when the temperature in the compost drops to 80 degrees um, or, you know, air temperature, if it's a warmer climate, they introduce worms to the compost and the worms complete the compost and they make a wonderful compost. But what, what's going to happen if I put worms in my Johnson Sioux bioreactor compost once it goes down to lower temperature? Fire ants are going to invade and eat, eat the worms, right? Uh, they're probably going to invade anyway. I can't stop that, but they'll definitely eat the worms. And I've wasted time and energy on worms again. If worms show up and they survive, worms show up and they survive, right? No problem. I have worms. It's like all worms get eliminated from the property. Just when I concentrate them in a location, they get they get taken over by ants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig holes in the compost towers and I'm going to put big handfuls of wine cap mushrooms and soak that down. And if I get mushrooms, I get mushrooms. If not, I get more fungal breakdown. So there's always ways you can implement things, but I wouldn't do hoogles for the purpose of mushrooms. But if it gave me mushrooms, I wouldn't argue. And you might find that like inoculation of the mulch with something like king oyster, especially on the, if you're going to have a mound, you're going to have some portion of that mound because it's three-dimensional that's always in shade or mostly in shade. And that's where I would give mushrooms a try. 
Uh, Cletus said, would you use Osage Orange for Hugel Culture or wood core? Uh, it's it's a very rot resistant wood. It's not like locust or something like that, but it's very rot resistant. It wouldn't be my first choice. However, since we're mostly going to use the slash, the bigger slash, you'll find that people will say things like, you know, black locust lasts for a hundred years or whatever. It's true of the heartwood, but the slash break that breaks down actually pretty quickly. So if it was what I had, and it made sense, then I would use it. But I wouldn't use big Osage orange logs because of the rot resistance. And you want the art of rot with uh, Hugo culture. Some of the most successful wood core beds I've seen have been done with sweet gum. And it breaks down incredibly fast. And you might get something like the whoever it was that asked about the Toba beds or whatever that I haven't heard, where you drop from six feet to two to three because sweet gum just goes, man. It's like two seasons and it's rotted to to all get out. And it, it does great growth, especially in short-term annual and quick-term perennials. Uh, Kansas Terry says, how close together can you plant those trees without the roots competing with each other? Um, she's talking about backyard or orchard culture. See, that's the thing, Terry. You want the roots to compete with each other. You want them to in intertwine in backyard or orchard culture because you're trying to limit the growth of the tree. Basically, we're making a big bonsai tree, bonsai tree is what you're doing. You're making a manipulated, controlled bonsai tree, and you're turning four trees or three trees or whatever you're doing, you're training it into basically a bush. So we want them relatively close together. And I'll have a link today in the notes as well uh, to the uh, Backyard Orchard Culture uh, article on uh, Dave Wilson Nursery for a little bit more on that. Uh, Andrew says, do you use full-size rootstock in backyard or orchard culture? We kind of covered that in the video. You can, and it's what I would recommend. And I would say semi-dwarf at the smallest. I don't like dwarfing rootstocks. You're, you're limiting the tree by limiting its foundation. And that means it's going to be less drought resistant. It's going to be less disease resistant. It's it, like over and over we have these issues, right? Where if we use a full-size rootstock and we dwarf the tree with pruning and training, we, we maintain all of the kind of the ass and heft of that full-size tree and we maintain a smaller tree. Principle over preference, therefore you must know the principles before the techniques. Roy at Avalon Farms. That's a good way to put it. Uh, one of my favorite people in the world, Vin Armani, is the first person I ever heard say principles over preference. He was talking more about political situations. Like, even though I would prefer this outcome, the principle is liberty. So I have to give this other person liberty. I can't interfere with their liberty. But I think that applies to permaculture design eloquently. The principles are care of the earth, care of people, return of surplus that we talked about from the very beginning, the ethics. And then the principles are design and strategy and tactic. The techniques are the means by which we obtain them. And so the principle dictates the technique and the tactical application, right? Strategy dictates the implementation. Uh, K-Bonk says, don't forget to thumbs up, viewers, indeed. Thank you for that. Uh, K-Bonk, any thoughts on human waste stream for biogas production and affluent fertilizer in the system? My personal view is that the best thing to do with human waste is – like human or composting. And I really wouldn't put a lot of effort personally and try and make biogas out of it. You can, if you want to, but basically deep litter for people, it's a cat box for people. So composting toilets and things like that are probably the best way to har harness that waste stream. Uh, that it would be for solid human waste for liquid human waste, i.e. urine. Um, there is a very easy way to handle that. And I do this right now. Uh, I, I've seen different ways to do it. Uh, one permaculture kind of, uh, is, you know, uh, recreational getaway, uh, agro-tourism place. They literally had like kind of like just a walled off area that gave a little bit of privacy. And that straw bales back there. And they call it the gentleman's pissatorium. And you went back there and you peed on a bale. And I guess when the bale got bad enough, they threw another bale where it was obvious where you're supposed to go. And you just peed on straw bales until the straw bales broke down. And they used it for, for, for mulch and fertilizer. Uh, and for compost. And it works really good because you're adding nitrogen to carbon, right? Because urine is high nitrogen. What I do is I have one of my um, tubs 
my mixing tubs that I use so often. You get them Lowe's and Home Depot. They come in 7, 14, and 21 gallons. I'm one of the 21 gallon ones, and I keep it kind of in an area where I go pee and I'm not offending my neighbors. And I keep a bucket of wood chips next to it, and I fill it, you know, maybe a couple inches deep with wood chips, and I pee on them. And when it's like you start to accumulate more than you really want to, I dump some more wood chips in there. And then when the bucket's empty, I refill it. And eventually it ends up completely full with urine soaked wood chips. And then I just push it into the shade, soak it down to make sure it stays damp and throw a, a piece of weed blocker over it so it doesn't dry out. And I leave it there and I make another one. By the time I've got the other one full, it's incredible compost, right? So you don't have to go all in on composting human waste. We poop in a toilet, flush it, it goes into a septic. It'd be nice to close that waste stream, but you know we're all working with what we can work with. Um, let's see, trying to figure out who else. Um, Hanging Laundry says, how about old rotting black walnut? So black walnut is alleopathic, meaning that it actually produces a chemical called juglone to compete with other plants by causing them not to grow or to grow poorly. So black walnuts outcompete their fellow plants through this process called alleopathy. Um, rotted black walnut wood, though, is probably not going to have much juglone in it. Most of the juglone is going to be in the leaves. And it's going to be in the husks of the walnuts. And when I say the husk, I don't mean the shell. I mean the husk. The part, if you pick it up, it gets all over your hands and stains them. When I was a kid, we used to use them. We would boil them in a big 50-gallon drum and brown. It's kind of like bluing a gun. Brown our traps with the, the extract from them. So I, I, it would not be my first choice, but it's probably not as bad as one would think. The thing about black walnut is it is such a valuable valuable timber, be better not to let it rot in the first place. Even what you think of as being waste stream from black walnut, if it's small, uh, bowl wood can be uh, basically made into veneers. And it's it's very, very valuable. Uh, question clarification. Tova was a typo. It should have been add to Google. I wasn't able to edit my first post. I, I'm not, I still don't understand the question. Let me go back and see if I can add to Google. Have you ever add, added to Google? We start, oh, added to a Google. Okay, I got you. So once the Google bed drops, do you add to it? No. I, I have it anyway. Um, all you would really be able to do is add, like you could add to it the way you add to a raised bed. And if you wanted to, like, just because I said that Seth builds these giant Google beds, and then basically plows them out and then grows in more flat type environments in many instances, doesn't mean that you have to. And if you're doing smaller hoogles for a garden, then it would make a lot of sense to maybe replicate that initial mulch cover and pin down with the wooden nails. But you wouldn't add to it as to try to bring it back to its original size. What you have now is amazing, valuable soil. And it doesn't necessarily have to stay in a mound unless that's what you want it to do. Don't think you can't leave it there. These original Hugel beds were done all over Germany, and they were done at the edges of fields to create hedgerows, usually of things like hazelnut. So they were productive, but they acted as fences, and they were left permanently. So they don't have to be flattened out. So when I said that, I was just pointing out that they're not – always the permanent structure that they're made out to be. Because the hedgerows, if you look at the history of World War II, were an incredible impediment to the Allied advance because these things were there for hundreds of years. Growing these basic fedges is a better word for it because they're food hedges, i.e. productive. Uh, Jonathan Campus, how do you feel about cypress trees for privacy wall here in West Fort Worth? Cypress does really well here. Um it is a deciduous needle tree. So it's not your typical evergreen conifer, meaning that it will turn this brassy color and all the needles will fall off. So it's not much of a hedge in your winter. And even prying closely together, they kind of have an open trunk fairly high up. So if it works for you, it works for you. Uh, but one thing you'll find with cypress, if you give it enough moisture to do well, it will send out knobs and you're going to have to cut the knobs off or you'll run into one with like a lawn tractor and wish you had cut the knobs off. If you're not knowing what I mean, cypress grow in swamp naturally. 
and they send up these big knobs off their root system as breathers. So they can grow where other trees would die due to low oxygen. And even if they don't need to do it, they tend to do it. So it's something to be aware of. Uh, I think that's the last all caps I have today. Nope. Resources for black walnut marketing for a small holder. I don't have any. I don't have any. Like, that's something that you're going to have to find locally. I'm not sure what resources there would be for what to do with your black walnut. But I will tell you this. If you have large enough black walnut trees to even make fireplace mantles, um, probably just digging around locally with sawmills and things like that and builders, especially custom builders, there's a market for it. Um, my grandfather had a black walnut tree toward the bottom of his yard, and it, I could I could not quite get my arms around it. So it was big, but not that big. Uh, and I was a smaller kid at the time. I was a teenager. So probably, you know, maybe not quite as, as big a bear hug as I can do now. And I couldn't quite get my arms around it. And one day a man offered him 800 bucks to let him cut the tree down. I thought my grandfather was going to kill the guy for asking, right? Which was a little bit of an overreaction because he didn't say I'm going to do it. He's asked him he would consider selling it. But he offered him $800 for this one walnut tree. And, and, and it wasn't really a high quality tree beyond the trunk. And all he wanted it for was the trunk to make a big, beautiful um, fireplace mantle. That was like 86. So black walnut is one of the highest priced timber crops you can grow. And it's a hundred year crop. So I'll finish with this. Just another example of technique. So what people would think is why, how, how could I ever make black walnut profitable as a hundred year timber crop? Well, what you do is you go and you plant much higher density than you need in black walnut, even if you were a monocrop. And then it's at about 15 to 20 years that you thin the first thinning, and that's veneer. And then it's about 30 years that you do your second thinning, and that's going to be veneer. And it's also going to be things like gun stocks and smaller pieces that can do other things. And that's going to leave the final growth to your old man trees that you're leaving to your, you know, your, your grandchildren. Right. So there is a lot that can be done. And, and there are systems of black walnut that you're into heavy harvest at 40 years if it's done right. Um, what do you recommend for a tree wall for privacy from Jonathan? OK, one more. It depends. And you're going to find people get students get very frustrated with that answer in permaculture. But it's it's, it's the right answer. Where do you live? How much privacy do you want? Are you trying to block view or sound? Because it's actually terrible for blocking sound. Trees do very little to block sound unless you have multiple layers of trees. One big privacy wall of like, um, I can't think of what they're called, but they're big, they look like a big, big pine tree, but they're more like a bush. Um, you can have them growing tightly next to each other, completely block everything out. Sound comes right through it like it's not there. So if you want privacy, you want something that's long-term, and provides the privacy you're looking for. And I think you're going to do much better with a model for privacy that's more like a baffled system. So if your trees not completely touching each other, but close in their mature state, and then you have a second layer that, that kind of goes in between, and even maybe a third layer, and now we function stack that. So not only is it blocking a view, it does begin to suppress sound. And if we have kind of like toxic ick coming off a road or something, it becomes a biofilter of flow onto our property. Uh, so it's it's what does well for you that provides the rapidity of growth and enough fullness. But like your fastest growing tree for that would be something like hybrid willow or hybrid poplar. And a lot of times people would be a little reluctant to do that as a border tree if they're permaculture, because I want fruit and nuts, man. I want fruit and nuts. Well, what do hybrid poplar and hybrid willow do for us? So we've learned from Nick Ferguson. They're fodder trees. So if we have goats or rabbits or something like that, we can grow those trees. We can pollard them so they get bushier and bushier and bushier over time. They don't have to be that tall to be a block. We can pollard them at about head height. And we keep getting this these stems that come back and branch out. And we have this fodder for our animals. And we get a privacy screen at the same time. And I, I personally think pollard poplar looks really cool so that would just be another option eb says you can use cypress and eb's not wrong with that i hope you enjoyed today we went two hours and 15 minutes i know this was a long one thank you to all of you that stuck through the whole thing um this is not easy to teach 
it requires me to be on air longer than I typically am for a podcast. But I feel that it is one of those things that over the years of having taught for so long now, that if you're going to teach it, you need to teach it right. Because again, I feel like when you give people these design techniques and even tactics, if it's absent and overriding strategy, it can lead to a lot of type one errors, a lot of anger, a lot of mistakes, and a lot of wish I didn't do that. And I want to empower you. And that's not the way that you empower people. So I'm happy to take the extra time. And thank you for those of you that spent it with me. I will be back tomorrow. We have an interview. Still don't know who it is. Uh, I haven't gotten the, the paperwork from Dorothy yet. I'll get it later today and get that set up for you guys. And remember, you can always stay in touch with us by getting on the TSP Telegram group. Just go to the survivalpodcast.com. Look at the bottom of any episode. And you'll see all the social media links that we have.